I didn't, I didn't know what it was, just flying back. I had to hear the nurses talking. It, it was a prison riot down there. And what, I'm paranoid, schizophrenic. What am I thinking? I'm thinking, if those inmates can take over that institution and set it on fire, what's going to keep these inmates from taking over this one and setting it on fire? And I'm in this seclusion room all naked, and I don't like smelling my own feces here, but I think it's going to be better than being burned to death alive because they're not going to check these seclusion rooms if this place catch on fire. So I'm panicking. I'm looking out that. I'm looking out. I'm looking at my fellow inmates, and it dawns on me. Dawns on me. You know, in the history of this country, we get prisoners rioting all the time, taking over those prisons. But in the history of this country, we have never had the mental patients get organized, take over the mental hospital, ever. And I'm looking out here, looking at these guys, one of them goose stepping around. I remember that right now. And I thought, these guys could never get organized to do anything. <laughs> I don't have to worry about these guys. But this is the time, this is the time 68 of no NAMI. Nobody spoke up for the mentally ill at all. I couldn't get a job for a year and a half. I, my graduate degree, my top graduate school in the country, I, it didn't matter. You mentally ill, you're not getting a job. Civil rights movement, African Americans, Hispanics, women, traditionally marginalized groups were organized, getting their rights. But the same thing that told me we could never organize to set this institution on fire, we can, we're never going to be able to organize to get any kind of rights. That was my thought in the summer of 68. This is my third hospitalization. Inside, I've shown you these pictures a lot. This is where, just like I was strapped down to in Milwaukee County Hospital, this is like the beds in the in the Ohio Hospital, 80 on a unit. Here's some typical satisfied customers. <laughs> and we all know what happened. With Thorazine, those conditions established, particularly by the Mennonites, other conscious objections. That 555,000 we had in the state hospitals in 1955 came down to, today it's, only about 50,000, 90%, 90, 95% 90, of us are, are out. But here's the important thing. When I was put away, brought before that court, and told I had a degenerative brain disease from which I would not recover, and that hammer went down, and said, I hereby declare you to be insane, and remand you to the hospital indefinitely. That was in 68. That could not happen five years later. Because in 68, the old rules were if you were floridly psychotic, we could lock you, we could treat you, whether you wanted it or not. And they did. But in the early 70s, the civil rights laws came out. Wisconsin was the first state. They changed that law. Not good enough just to be floridly psychotic. You've got to be able to prove in a court somebody's eminently dangerous to themselves or others. And of course, that made it real tough to get somebody in, as we know. We not only could get people out of the hospitals, we could get, keep them from coming back in. The most successful public health initiative in the history of this country, if your version of success is, did we get them out of the hospital? Well, we did. I got out of there. I got my freedom. Yeah, we got our freedom. John Stuart Mill on liberty. Yeah, we're free. We're free as a bird. Free from psychiatric oppression. Uncle Fred won. We're free from psychiatric oppression. But where were we? Well, you know. We, um... 150,000, very soon, 150,000 of us in the streets. This is not working. This guy's home. I can see him. You can't. 
This guy's a homeless mentally ill. 150,000. I still like to talk to him when I go to Washington, New York. I didn't talk to him in San Antonio. Many of them veterans. Why? Why? Lay in the streets, homeless, 150,000. The official figure was 25,000 in jails and prisons when I started this campaign 25 years ago. That figure is now 350,000 criminalizing the mentally ill because the police pick them up. Gonna have them freeze to death out here in the wintertime like my nephew was in Philadelphia? No. Criminalization of the mentally ill. You got them. That's when CIT came along. Nobody told you about brain disorder. Nobody told you about mentally ill. They just, you, all they taught you was if they're breaking the law, you got to pick them up. And you changed the world. You really have. Thank goodness. In our state, and this country for that matter, Justice Stratton, Justice Stratton, we're so lucky to have the Joan of Arc of mental illness. I went to her inauguration ceremony last year, and all the justices said, Eve, you got a job here as a Supreme Court justice, but everybody knows you do much more for the mentally ill than anybody else, anybody in the country, really. And why? Why? She came to this country, child of missionaries. Never been to this country since she was 18 years old, came with $500 in her purse to go to college. Worked her way through the University of Akron to the Ohio State Law School, became an attorney, then she became the first woman to ever be a judge in Franklin County. And then when the opening came up in the Supreme Court, 800 and something judges in Ohio, the governor said, I won't eat. Supreme Court justice, one of the youngest, only, only a woman. Should have been a wonderful day for her, but it, it wasn't. And why wasn't it? Because of the love of her life, her 12-year-old son tried to commit suicide, and he was put in a psychiatric ward for two weeks. And she goes and visits him, and it dawns on her. She's the one been wearing the jacket. She's the one been determined if people are insane, if their income stands right, and she doesn't know anything about mental illness. Ten years ago. So one of the reasons we have more CIT programs, 77 out of 88 counties in Ohio, we have all those mental health courts, we have sequential intercept model coming, is because Eve, as she'll say, funny, but when you get to be the Supreme Court justice, people return your telephone call. <laughs> We've had Joan of Arc in there, and with Steve Leifman, your opening, those two were the chair of the National Association for Justices for Mental Health, criminal justice, they're pedal to the metal to get every state at the Supreme Court justice level to focus on the problems of mental health. So we're moving forward on these things. We're moving forward on taking care of those. Mark Munitz, uh, he's a psychiatrist taking this lead statewide, a great guy. He was here. The, um, only endowed chair at our medical school, and it's of psychiatry, and his major interest is criminal justice. We put in the CIT 10 years ago. We're the first one in the northern United States to do it. Fantastic. Let me tell you what dawned on me. I was taught in that first class. It's happened over and over again. And they let me be the first speaker. 25 officers. One of them comes at the break, up to me, looks around. Not sure there was a tear in his eye. Says to me, Dr. Freeze, I'm gonna tell you something these other officers don't know. I said, what's that? He said, my mother's been in that state hospital for the last 20 years. Thank you, officer. Another one came up and said, Thank you, Dr. Freeze. I, I, I volunteer for this class because we've got a son with ADHD and we don't, don't know how to handle him, but we learned something. That was 10 years ago. I gave a talk annually at the medical school 
with Mikey Owey's help here coming up next week again. Gave that talk, got... We got 250 medical and pharmacy students in the class, and I gave the class last week, usual class, I'm like this, and one of them comes up to me and says, Dr. Freeze, I just want you to know, I, f I first heard your lecture when I was a CIT officer, and now I'm a medical student. Thanks for the inspiration. Where the rubber meets the road, Akron, Ohio. Yeah. Make all them tires. Firestone it. Good year. Good rich. Uniroyal. Make them all. Till the 80s when we lost those 35,000 jobs. That advertising slogan for Firestone, where the rubber meets the road. We kind of had to modify that. Just the university. We now call it where the, where the polymer meets the pavement. Polymer research doesn't hire as many people as, a, as the rubber business does. So we don't have rubber anymore. What do we got? What's Akron, Ohio got to keep it alive? You got any friends of Bill in here? Yeah, I see a heads on. Yeah, we got Dr. Bob, Mr. Bill. A.E., -E, Alcohol Anonymous, founded right there in Mayflower Hotel in the 30s in the Depression. Recovery. We're recovering from, from alcohol, from substance abuse. Can you also recover from mental illness? Yeah, we're going like a lot of places. I just gave a talk night before last in uh, Bradford, Pennsylvania. Manufactures Zippo lighters. Got a wonderful museum to Zippo. <laughs> wonderful. But people don't smoke so much anymore, and they got these little Japanese things that are automatic. They don't lost their population. Went from 25,000 to 10,000 in 10 years. Yeah. But we got our spirit. We got AA. Dr. Bob, Mr. Bill, that's what we're doing now in the Midwest. Carving out our manufacturing. Don't make those automobiles anymore. Well, what we do? We're putting in museums. Yeah, we got the museum, the Pro Hood Football Hall of Fame. We got the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Akron. We got a brand new one coming in. It's the National Museum of Psychology. Yeah, yeah. $16 million. Got a museum coming in. So what? Well, this mental illness has something to do with psychology. Yeah. Which means for the last uh, two years, we've been having world foremost authority psychologists come in and give us speeches. And all the speeches have been nice. But one was most memorable. Most memorable speech, and I've quoted him in about 100 speeches since then, by Dr. White. Dr. Robert White, fantastic speaker, and he talks about inclusion. Including... People. He's African American. Says when he started out, there weren't any African American. They weren't included. Hispanics weren't included. Women weren't included. Got a friend who wrote a book, wonderful book. It's called "And Even the Rat Was White." He gives a speech, wonderful speech. But at the end, gets a microphone for questions. I get up and say. Dr. White, that was a fantastic speech on inclusion. I certainly agree people should be included. I just want to know one thing. This organization of yours, the American Psychological Association, 150,000 members, how many schizophrenics do you have in that organization? And when I ask that question, he freaks. He freaks. Schizophrenia, that's a shameful condition. That is shameful. We would never have anybody with that shameful condition. No, we would never. Now, having had schizophrenia for a while, you learn how to live with this thing. <laughs> and one thing you have is a thing called psychotic rage. 